Okay, we're going to get started. Um, just before we get into the class, if people could type into the, te uh, the chat section whether or not they can hear me. That would be lovely. All right, so if anybody has any troubles, please use the um, chat section to let me know. So first of all, just some housekeeping things, um, how this class works. Uh, some Definitely some of you have taken some of our other classes, so you're probably pretty familiar with things. So um, forgive me if I repeat myself, uh, but this is a lecture demo style class. So we won't be following along with the cooking, which would take a very long time, um, but we will be, um, usually we show videos of the recipes and I explain um, what's going on in them. Um, but last time we had some internet lag troubles, so we decided to change things to a photograph um, style. So there will be pictures of the process of cooking the food and I will be explaining as we proceed. Um, that along with the um, recipe packets that you all received with the link and which will later be posted on our website um, should give you a nice, um, a nice resource for continuing on with these recipes on, in your own time. Action time. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Kip Sienna Hopkins and I'm the marketing manager and the, gra the graphic designer at the Blue Hill Co-op. I'm also a blogger and a Japan enthusiast, um, which I swear comes in later. Um, but in my role as the graphic designer at the Blue Hill Co-op, one of the things that I do is the um, guide to series that we have on various um, merchandise products that we carry there, such as the tea towels, which are hugely popular, and the spin-off uh, aprons. And we also have posters and some other things. Um, but the reason I bring it up is because the first guide to that we did was actually for winter squash varieties, which I did because I love winter squash. I think that they're beautiful and colorful and they have such a wide variety of uses and they're just fantastic. So I made that guide to winter squash um, uh, not too long after I started uh, this position at the co-op and, um, and all the others came from that particular spark of inspiration. Um, but also about my blog, it's wishokude.com and it's a blog about Japanese food and culture. And I do some different things on there, including I'm um, talking about my experience with cooking Japanese food. Um, I give information about different dishes. Um, sometimes we share recipes. Uh, recently I've been doing keto res uh, recipe variations on Japanese dishes. Um, and we also do some cultural exploration and some Japanese history. I don't know why I said we, it's just me. I do some cultural exploration and Japanese history. Um, so in all of these classes, the first class that we did was actually on Japanese cooking, um, but in all these classes, I try to include a couple of Japanese recipes because I love Japanese food. But this class is all about squash. So let's get started with talking about what squash actually is and what the difference is between squashes and pumpkins and gourds. Well, all, all of those things come from the Cucupertaceae family, um, which consists of over 900 different plants and includes squashes, pumpkins, gourds, and melons. Um, and uh, technically pumpkins um, are also squashes. So when you say squash, really you're talking about pumpkins, summer squash, and zucchini all included together. But this class is really focusing on winter squash, which are the fruit, not a vegetable, but actually the fruit of plants um, in the Cupertae, Cupertae um, genus. And they're different from summer squashes and zucchinis um, because they're harvested when the skin has hardened and the seeds are fully matured. And they're called winter squash, not because they're grown in winter, but because their hard skin makes them really easy to store throughout the winter. So they're an excellent uh, crop to have in your house for the winter. In fact, last year we had a ton of um, winter squash that my mother grew on our farm and we had squash pretty much all through the year. Um, you just have to keep it in a cool dry space. Um, but you can also buy squash. Um, 
So most, uh, most varieties are available from like early fall through late winter. Um, but some like kabocha and butternut are actually available year round. So that's always fun. Um, pumpkins are a particular type of winter squash. Um, but in some countries like Australia and New Zealand, they actually use the word pumpkin to describe all winter squashes, um, which I think is interesting. Uh, but gourds, on the other hand, are, um, they're in the same family, but they're generally just grown for decorative purposes, not for food consumption. Um, but gourds are actually indigenous to Africa, whereas um, squash are indigenous to the Americas. Um, but in Africa, they use, have been using gourds um, for traditional instruments and as vessels for storing food and um, liquids and things uh, for a really long time. So there's um, some really interesting stuff about that as well. But those are gourds, not squashes. Um, so some history about squashes. Uh, as I mentioned, squashes are indigenous to the Americas and they were present there before the arrival of humans, um, but humans have been cultivating varieties of squash um, and they've been uh, hugely important for um, different cultures of Native American peoples um, from South America through Mesoamerica um, to all the way up to Southern Canada. Uh, domestication of squash dates back at least 8,000 years, which actually predates the cultivation of maize or corn and beans by about 4,000 years. Um, but these three things, uh, squash, maize, and beans, are actually known as the Three Sisters, um, and they were staples for many tribes and societies in the Americas. And the Three Sisters um, system is a companion planting method where they take um, several maize seeds and they plant them at the top of a flat topped mound. And once the plants grow tall enough, they plant beans and squash around the maize, alternating the seeds. And then um, the maize provides a structure for the beans to climb up and the beans provide nitrogen in the soil and the squash provides ground cover and it discourages weeds from growing and the squash um, also keeps the soil most moist. It's like a natural mulch. And um, I don't know how familiar you are with squash vines, but they have a really um, prickly, uh, not spiny, but they have these very fine, tough hairs all over them that um, actually help discourage pests from both um, eating the squash and from eating the beans and maize. So it's this really cool symbiotic system. Um, the practice was first developed in Mesoamerica and then it traveled up um, to North America as well. Uh, but some different, a lot of different cooking methods were used, but um, generally there was the common method of um, roasting or boiling uh, squash and then preserving it in uh, syrups. Pretty much the whole squash was used and um, the seeds were also eaten um, and ground into a paste or roasted. Um, and when Europeans arrived in the American continent in the um, 1490s, uh, they encountered many new world, finger quotes, uh, crops like tomatoes and potatoes and avocados and squash. Uh, squash were brought back to Europe and they became particularly popular in France and Spain uh, where they developed a lot of new varieties. Um, but squash didn't really take off in Northern Europe due to the shorter growing season and um, the uh, colder climate, but pumpkins actually came to England um, via France in the 16th century. Um, and they were originally called pumpions, which is adorable. And uh, pumpkin pie was actually developed in Tudor England first and then brought to the American colonies um, where it became kind of the quintessential New England dessert that we all know and love today. Um, but squash were also brought all over the world um, via the trading routes. And they um, ended up in Asia and Australia and all over. And a lot of cultures kind of developed their own, um, their own dishes and flavors around squash. And a lot of places also developed their own varieties, which is very neat. Um, Jack-o-lanterns, uh, which you're all probably familiar with this time of year, is actually an Irish tradition um, that they originally used uh, turnips and other root vegetables like rutabagas for, and uh, 
I have tried this and it is extremely difficult because it's not easy to hollow out a turnip as you can probably imagine. Um, so when Irish immigrants started to come to America, uh, they found it much easier to use pumpkins for jack-o'-lanterns since they were pretty much all already hollow. So um, today the medium of pumpkins has become uh, the norm for the jack-o'-lantern. But squash have found their way all around the world. Um, pretty much any cuisine that you're interested in, any style of food that you like to cook, you can find a recipe that uses squash from that particular place. Um, for instance, in Spain, um, they use them for a lot of soups and stews, um, as well as sweet foods. Um, like there's this uh, dish that's like a cross between a churro and a donut that's pumpkin flavored that's really popular in Spain. Um, in Italy, pumpkin risotto is actually one of the most popular types of risotto. It's also popular for breads and soups and pasta dishes. Uh, in India, it's used for a lot of curry dishes. Um, in Japan, there are several different types of um, Japanese squash varieties that we'll talk about later, um, but uh, it's known for like kabocha, for instance. Um, but they use squash in a lot of different side dishes and soups and tempura um, in desserts. Uh, in the Philippines and Taiwan and Thailand and a lot of other East Asian countries, they use squash in recipes in curries and in dish different dishes, um, pairing it with coconut milk, which is a really nice combination. Um, there are a lot of uh, sweet and savory dishes from the Middle East and from Northern Africa that use squashes. Um, and then of course in Mexico, the original home of the squash, there are a lot of different recipes that utilize the vegetable um, from empanadas and um, enchiladas and different kinds of soups and chilies and all kinds of delicious things. So um, like I said, pretty much any kind of cuisine that you're interested in, you can, you can bet that there's some squash in there. Um, some of the health benefits of squash and um, just a disclaimer, I'm not a uh, nutritionist, so take what I say with a grain of salt, but squash are a low calorie food and they're um, a complex vegetable carbohydrate um, that's high in dietary fiber, which makes them um, a pretty healthy option for people with blood sugar problems or diabetes. Um, it's also an excellent source of vitamin A, uh, vitamin C, potassium, uh, manganese, folate, omega-3 fatty acids, um, vitamins B1, B6, B3 and B5, um, as well as copper, tryptophan, and um, iron. And of course, beta carotene is the pigment that gives squash their bright yellow color. And it's converted to vitamin A in the body, which helps with eye health and mucous membranes, which sound gross, but are important. And um, it also gives your skin a youthful glow and uh, natural UV protection. So that's pretty cool. Of course, um, beta carotene is probably best known for being in carrots, but it is certainly in a lot of squash. Well, on all the squash, because they're pretty much all yellow. So now we're going to cover the different varieties of squash that we've been having at the co-op this season. And uh, for each uh, variety, we're gonna uh, talk about a different recipe using them. So starting with the, whoops, starting with the delicata squash, um, which is also known as the bohemian squash, the peanut squash, which is adorable, um, and the sweet potato squash. It's an heirloom variety and it has a sweet flavor that's um, kind of similar to a sweet potato. And the texture's got medium moisture um, and it's fine grained. Uh, it's got skin that is thin and edible when cooked. So um, you don't have to worry about peeling it, which is good because it's rather bumpy and that would be kind of a pain. Um, the seeds are small and nutty. So those are um, pretty nice to roast and toast. Um, I'm not gonna read a lot all of those pairings, but you get the idea. It pairs well with lots of things. Um, but uh, delicata can be um, baked or roasted, um, steamed, broiled, sauteed. Um, because of the skin being so thin, uh, it's commonly used for roasting in slices and then you can just eat them whole. Um, but the shape also lends itself really well to stuffing. So that's another popular way of doing it. Um, delicatas were actually first introduced in, the, in 1894. And 
it was popular until the depression, but it fell out of favor because um, it's vulnerable, or at the time it was vulnerable to, to, to diseases and it had a shorter shelf life. Um, but in the late 1990s, uh, Cornell University developed a higher yield disease resistant variety um, known as the Cornell Bush Delicata. And this brought it back into popularity. And today it's getting more popular all the time. Uh, it contains vitamins A and C, some B vitamins, potassium, fiber, and beta carotene. So for this recipe, um, we did a delicata ricotta pizza, um, which was very tasty. Uh, so I actually just used um, a pre-made uh, crust for this. I used the Capello grain-free crust um, that we carry at the co-op in the freezer section, which is made with almond meal. And actually I was really surprised the texture is fantastic. You can almost not even tell that you're eating a um, almond meal uh, pizza crust. It's really lovely. Um, so this uses uh, delicata squash, ricotta cheese, shredded mozzarella, um, some yellow onion, garlic, olive oil, dried basil, dried oregano, and dried thyme. And um, I didn't give you specific portion sizes because it'll depend on the size of your crust that you use. Um, but this was a pretty small crust, the um, Capella ones. So I used um, half a delicata squash for this. So first you're gonna start out by cutting the delicata squash in half um, lengthwise and scooping out the seeds and guts and saving them to roast. And then you're going to slice them into half moons that are about a half an inch, quarter of an inch, half an inch thick, somewhere in there. And then you're going to lay them out on a sheet in a single layer, um, drizzle them with some olive oil, salt and pepper. And you're going to bake them at 350 degrees for about 25 minutes. While they're baking, you can slice up an onion into some thin slices and saute it in some olive oil uh, with a little salt and pepper um, until the onions have just started to turn translucent. You could also caramel them if you're more patient than me. Um, and then you're going to uh, take your pizza crust and um, start with a base of olive oil and some garlic, and then your dried uh, herbs, and then on top of that, your delicata squash, and then on top of that, your onions. And um, leftover from my days of working in a pizzeria, I always put my non-cheese toppings on the bottom and then cover them over with cheese, which I think keeps everything nice and moist and yummy. So then you're gonna um, put down your ricotta and your mozzarella on top of that, and then you can bake it in the oven uh, for at uh, 350 degrees for about 15 to 25 minutes. It'll depend on the crust that you use, but um, and you know how how dark your how hot your oven gets. I have a kind of a funny oven, so uh, anyway, that's what you do. Uh, I really liked this pizza. I I'm not super adventurous with my pizza toppings, generally speaking. Um, my favorite would be pineapple, um, but I really liked the delicata squash on there. The texture was really nice and um, not too uh, not too moist, and it the sweet, um, slight nuttiness of the squash really paired well with the mildness of the mozzarella and the ricotta. The textures went really well together. The onion was perfect. Um, I definitely really liked this um, and will certainly repeat it. Highly recommend. Next up, we have the carnival squash, which is actually a hybrid of the sweet dumpling and the acorn squash. Um, it's got a lightly nutty, buttery um, and sweet flavor with nuances of maple syrup. Um, it's kind of similar to a butternut squash, but it's a little drier. Uh, it's got a soft and tender texture. Uh, the skin is thin and edible, um, and the seeds are small and nutty with a medium fiber. Um, carnival squash are good for uh, broiling, um, steaming, roasting, and sautéing. Um, they can be blended into soups and made into risottos or sauces, um, but because of its shape and its size, it's really ideal for um, making into an edible vessel. Um, and it's a really nice serving size. Um, 
So that's what we're going to do later. But uh, it contains uh, potassium, vitamins A and C, calcium, magnesium, uh, folate, omega-3 fatty acids, and omega-6 fatty acids. Um, and it's also really cute. So for this squash, I invented the Ringmaster pie. So I'm actually a big fan of savory pies. In fact, I'm surprised I didn't schedule a savory pie class because they're one of my obsessions. And I particularly enjoy um, the uh, variations of the, um, what you might call the shepherd's pie model. Um, but I'm absolutely fanatic about getting the name right based on what kind of meat it's made with. So for future reference, a shepherd's pie is made with lamb. If you make it with beef, it's a cottage pie. I will also accept Wrangler's pie, which is what my grandmother called it. Uh, if you make it with fish, it's called a fisherman's pie. And if you uh, make it with um, without any kind of meat, if it's just a vegetable pie that's the same style, then it is a shepherdess pie. So there's no such thing in my book as a vegan shepherd's pie. It is a vegan shepherdess pie. Uh, and then there's also the St. Stephen's Day pie, which is a combination of turkey and ham. But all these ones use a top that is mashed potatoes. But because I live in a family in which one of the people does not eat potatoes, um, generally speaking, I usually make them with a um, mashed rutabaga top or a mashed squash top. So this uh, Ringmaster's pie, so-called because it's made with carnival squash, um, uses the squash as a vessel, which sort of creates the same effect as the uh, top, um, mashed top. So this is uh, my clever take on that. I'm just telling you, I'm clever. Uh, so this recipe uses about three carnival squashes um, and it's got a pound of ground beef. Uh, you could also use ground um, lamb, but uh, ground beef, uh, a small onion, um, some garlic. Um, I used mixed frozen vegetables, which is like uh, carrots, corn, peas, and beans. Um, some tomato paste, Worcestershire sauce, some potato starch to thicken it, um, some beef broth, and I actually just use um, the better than bouillon beef um, uh, paste that we carry at the co-op. Keep that in my fridge because I usually don't use, I'm using beef broth for like making a gravy or sauce or something. So I don't like to have a whole container open at a time because I never go through it all. Um, and then you'll just need some olive oil for sauteing. So to start with, you're gonna cut the squash top off about an inch or an inch and a half um, down from the top. And um, you want it to be a nice little um, lid for your vessel. Then you're gonna take out the guts and seeds and turn your squashes over um, cut side down on a baking sheet. And you're going to want to pre-bake them at 375 degrees for about 30 minutes. And then you can poke it with a fork, poke the inside though, not the outside, because you don't want it to spring a leak. Not that it's a particularly wet recipe, but just to be on the safe side. Um, but you want it to be um, a little bit tender uh, when you poke it with a fork. Um, while you're roasting your squashes, you can uh, use some oil in a pan and saute your onions with some garlic. And once they start to turn translucent, you can add in your meat and break it up with your spatula. Once the meat is just starting to cook, you can add in the tomato paste and the Worcestershire sauce and the salt and pepper. And then I thought out, um, you know, pre-thought out my mixed vegetables and added it in at this point. And then I um, stirred it in and used a small sieve to sprinkle in my potato starch, mixed that in, and then added in the, the broth and cooked until that had thickened up. Then when my squash came out of the oven, I filled them up and put the lids back on, the lids, so to speak, and then put them back in the oven at 375 for another 35 minutes or until the squash is nice and tender. Um, I really liked this dish. It was um, self-contained and it was pretty much a single serving. So it's a nice, impressive looking dish. Um, it'd be great for a dinner party if any of us were having dinner parties at this point. 
but it was also just a nice enjoyable um, meal to have. Um, it's uh, perfect for getting like a scoop of the filling and a scoop of the side. It's really easy to eat. The top is also really yummy. Um, so yeah, it was definitely uh, a big success in my book. Next up, we have the kabocha squash, which is my personal favorite squash. Um, it is a Japanese, um, also known as Japanese pumpkin. And it is um, uh, buttery and sweet with a rich nutty flavor that's kind of reminiscent of a sweet potato and a pumpkin, but it's sweeter than a pumpkin. I would say it's kind of like halfway between a pumpkin and a buttercup squash. Uh, the texture is fine grained, um, dry and tender. Um, it's thin uh, skinned, which is edible. Um, and it has seeds that are large and fibrous. They're like, they're edible. They're not like the most pleasant seed to eat. Oh, uh, does the potato starch thicken the vegetable mix? Um, it's, uh, it's definitely optional. You don't need to use it. It just thickens the, um, the gravy if you're using beef broth in it. Um, I, I like to use potato starch instead of flour um, because uh, not everyone in my family can have grains. Um, and, uh, but you could also use cornstarch for it if you wanted. I like potato starch because it pretty much works exactly like cornstarch. It's flavorless. Um, so it's pretty nice. Um, let's see. So what was I saying about kabocha squash? Oh, um, so kabocha squash are um, roasted, steamed, sauteed, baked. Um, they're used in frying for like uh, tempura. Um, they're braised. They're really wonderful for soups, um, curries. I like to put mine in Japanese curry uh, for nimono, which is a um, simmered dish. Um, you can stuff dumplings with them, tempura as mentioned, um, and a lot of other dishes. Uh, oh yeah, you could use kuzu starch too. Um, uh, kabocha is actually the Japanese word for squash and pumpkin. Um, so if you're in Japan, um, perchance, lucky you, uh, you will find all varieties called kabocha. Um, but in the US, it's used for just the kabocha varieties, air quotes. Um, it also includes things like uh, red curry and the sunshine kabocha. Sunshine kabocha looks pretty much exactly like the regular kabocha, except for it's a bright orange color. Um, and uh, the red curry is a really dark red color on the outside and then it's got kind of a little cap on the top. Um, so those are also really yummy to check out. The red curry really tastes very honey-like. It's quite good. Um, but it's believed that the kabocha pumpkin was first brought to Japan by Portuguese traders in the 1500s. And then over time they developed it into the wonderful thing that it is now. Um, it contains vitamin A and C, um, some B uh, vitamin, uh, calcium, iron, fiber, and the seeds actually have a lot of zinc. So even though I said they were large in fibers, if you like zinc, you could eat them. Uh, so for the kabocha squash, I had a hard time deciding which wonderful kabocha squash recipe to use, but I ended up going with kabocha koroke, which is pretty much my family's favorite way to have squash. Um, oh, one, one moment. Okay, sorry. Um, so this is a Japanese version of the um, croquette, which is a French food, I believe. Um, usually croquettes are made with potato and you can make karaoke with potato, but why make it with potato when you can make it with kabocha? So this uses um, a pound of kabocha squash, which for me ended up being about half of a kabocha. Um, and then you're gonna use a little bit of oil for some sauteing, half a pound of ground beef, or you can use ground pork, um, half an onion minced, uh, some salt, some nutmeg, um, a little black pepper to taste. And then the coating on, on the outside is made with some flour, um, eggs, and some panko, which is Japanese breadcrumbs. 
And then optional, these ones are actually baked, but optional, you can um, deep fry them, which is how they're traditionally made. And it's absolutely delicious. The baked version is also good, but um, it's a little healthier, which means that it's a little less delicious. Uh, but I actually use coconut oil when I fry them, um, which I think makes them a lot lighter and it um, doesn't add any flavor to it or anything, but it's a little bit healthier option for when you deep fry your food. Um, so to start with, you're gonna cut your kabocha squash in half and bake it, um, let's see, what did I do? I baked it at 350 degrees for um, 25 to 35 minutes. Um, you don't wanna overcook it because if you overcook it, it's gonna get a little too wet. Um, and I, in fact, did overcook mine a little bit. Um, so you just wanna be careful that you want it to be just cooked. Um, you don't want it to be um, accumulating water in the bottom of your pan. Uh, you can also alternatively, um, if you have a microwave, which I don't, um, you can uh, peel it while it, before it's cooked and cube it, and then you can cook it. I think it's for about like four minutes or so, um, and that's another quick way to do it. Um, but at any rate, after you roast it, um, you're going to want to scrape it out, um, weigh the amount that you need, and set it to the side. As you can see in my bowl here, I had a lot of extra liquid down in the bottom and I ended up um, draining it. So then you're going to want to saute your onions and once they start to get translucent, you can add in your ground beef and salt and pepper. And you're gonna wanna break the meat up so that it's in small pieces and cook it until it's fully cooked. Then you're gonna to wanna to mix together your kabocha squash and your meat. And you're gonna to wanna to add your um, nutmeg in at this point too, and make sure that it's salt and peppery enough. And then you are going to prepare three bowls, one with some beaten egg and one with some um, flour and one with some panko. And then you're going to divide your squash filling into about six even portions. Oh, eight even portions. I guess I have eight here. Um, six or eight. And then you're going to, um, you're going to do each one at a time and you're going to form each portion into a oval sphere. And then you're going to roll it in the flour first and then in the egg and then finally coat it in the panko and set it to the side and do each um, each one in turn. You probably want to wash your hands in between each one because it can get kind of messy. Uh, so then if you're baking them, you will want to put them in a baking dish and you will bake them at 400 degrees for 10 to 15, min uh, 10 to 15 minutes until they are um, golden brown on the outside and crispy. If you're um, frying them, you'll want to put them in the refrigerator for about an hour after you finish coating them so that they hold together better in the oil. And um, you'll want to cook them in oil that's 350 degrees. Uh, I think generally it's about four minutes on each side. You kind of turn them over in the middle. Um, but pretty much you're just going to cook them until they're golden brown and crispy and delicious. I really like karaoke because the um, inside is really um, soft, or not soft, smooth, and it's got that wonderful nutty, slightly sweet flavor. It pairs really well with the meat. It has some nutmeg in there, which goes really well. And then the outside is crispy and crunchy. So um, actually they're pretty easy to just eat with one hand, which is nice, um, but they're really, truly delicious. They're good hot. They're also fine when, if they're cold. Um, you can even refrigerate them overnight if you somehow have leftovers. Um, so they're definitely pretty good. Also, I haven't tried this, but I have a sneaking suspicion that if you bake them and then you freeze them, you would pretty easily be able to take them out of the freezer um, and uh, you know let them thaw out and then deep fry them. So you could have them in your freezer for a quick, easy, delicious, um, snack. Um, uh, traditionally, you would serve them on a bed of 
uh, shredded green cabbage. I only had red cabbage, that's why there's red cabbage on that plate. Um, and then I also used a um, tonkatsu sauce on them, which is a sweet um, sauce that you can buy at Asian grocery stores. You can order it online. Uh, and it's kind of like a fruitier version of Worcestershire sauce. Pretty tasty. Okay, next up is the buttercup squash. Now, actually, a lot of people get buttercup squashes and um, raw or cooked cabbage, raw cabbage. Um, that's kind of pretty standard for fried food in Japan is to use um, shredded, to pair um, fried foods with shredded cabbage, um, raw cabbage. It's nice, it kind of cuts the, um, the richness of the fried food, it's good. Uh, but a lot of people get buttercup squash and um, kabocha squash mixed up because they look kind of similar. Um, but the buttercup squash has a little round nubby top to it or bottom, depending on which side is up. Um, it's, I believe, called the little turban. Um, so that's how you tell the difference. Um, and they're not particularly similar flavor wise. So it's good to know the difference. Uh, people also tend to get buttercups and butternuts mixed up name wise, but they are very different. Uh, but the buttercup is a very lovely squash. It um, has a mild sweet flavor, um, similar to chestnuts and kind of similar to sweet potatoes. Uh, it's got a semi-dry satiny smooth um, texture. I really like the texture of buttercup squashes. Some people think they're a little too dry. I think they're wonderfully divine. Um, the skin is tough, but technically edible. Um, the seeds are large and kind of mediumly fibrous. Um, they're good for baking and steaming and roasting. I actually really like to just um, bake them and um, just make them uh, moister with some butter and they're really good that way. I really like that satiny um, texture. Um, because if it's drier texture, they work really well for soups and stews that kind of hold their form more. Um, they're also good for things like ravioli fillings or risottos or curries and for sauces. Uh, but they contain um, vitamin A, beta carotene, fiber, and some vitamin C's, some vitamin C. So for this soup, I adapted one of my mother's favorite recipes for buttercup soup. And it's a buttercup cheddar soup, but I used um, Synergy cheddar cheese, which is a new cheese that we're carrying at the co-op right now um, that was developed specifically for National Co-op Month this year. And it's from um, Cabot and uh, Jasper Hill Farm. So um, it's exclusive to co-ops that are members of NCG. Um, and it's a really sharp cheddar. It's very nutty. It's aged really long. It, I keep saying that it's like a marriage between cheddar cheese and Parmigiano Reggiano. Um, it's got like, if you have like um, a sharp cheddar that has those little crystals in it, it's got that. And the nuttiness just goes amazingly with the buttercup um, squash. Uh, but you can also, if you um, are making this at a time when Synergy is not available, you can certainly use just a regular sharp cheddar or actually um, one of the people who I live with can't have aged cheeses. We have a lot of dietary restrictions in our family. Um, so I actually set some aside for her and she had it with mozzarella and she said it was really good. Uh, so for this, you're gonna use one buttercup squash, uh, two shallots, um, some garlic, some celery. Um, you can either use vegetable stock or you can use chicken stock depending on if you want it to be vegetarian or not. Um, fresh thyme, fresh sage, a bay leaf, some salt and pepper, and of course the Synergy cheddar cheese. I used the whole block for this because like we love cheese, um, but uh, you can vary the amount of cheese depending on your preference. I was actually grating the cheese and my mother walked into the kitchen and I was like, is this too much cheese? And she was like, ah, no. <laughs> So you're gonna start by cutting the squash in half and scooping out the insides. And then you're gonna use a sharp knife to peel the outside and then cut it into cubes for once we're not roasting it beforehand. And then you're going to saute your shallots and garlic in 
some olive oil. And when the shallots start to get fragrant, you can add in the celery. And then once things start to get translucent, uh, things being the shallots, um, you can add in your um, herbs and your salt and pepper. Then once uh, that's done, you will add in your squash and then you want to cover it with the broth. You don't want to put in too much broth, so depending on how big your squash is, you just want it to cover the squash. Then you're going to bring it to a boil and then turn it to simmer and you're going to cook it for, I think it was about 15 minutes until you, when you stab the squash with a fork, it goes in. Then you're going to um, take it off the stove, let it sit for uh, about five minutes so it's not boiling hot. And then either you can use a, if you're lucky enough to have one, a full immersion blender, or you can use a tabletop blender and blend it into a nice puree. Uh, then you're gonna wanna um, grate your cheese and um, keep the soup off the heat, um, but then put the cheese into the soup and mix it in so that it gets all nice and melty. And I topped mine with a little bit of cheese for a uh, dramatic effect. And um, it was really good. It has a lovely texture, that um, smooth satiny texture of the um, squash really lent itself to a pureed soup. As I said, the nuttiness of the cheese was just fantastic paired with the squash. So I would really recommend this soup uh, to all squash and cheese lovers. If you don't like cheese too, you could also just leave the cheese out. I'm sure it would still be a really good soup. Uh, next up, we have the honey nut squash. Now the honey nut squash is actually a hybrid of the butternut and the um, buttercup squash, but it's a really cute, tiny little, it looks like a miniature butternut squash. Um, it's probably the sweetest of the common squashes. Um, it's got a really nutty caramel malt-like flavor to it. Um, and it's tender and quite creamy. It's actually, it's pretty much got the texture of, of a um, butter nut squash, um, but it's really delicious. They're definitely one of my favorites. And I really like how they're, the size of them really lends itself to like a single serving portion. Um, the skin is medium thickness, technically edible, but I don't know why you would want to eat it. Um, the seeds are small and pretty low in fiber, meaning that they're easier to eat. Um, but honey nuts are great for roasting or baking, um, boiling, sauteing. Um, I actually really just like to cut them in half and roast them and then um, they look really nice on a plate just by themselves. You put a little butter in there, it's delicious. Uh, but Definitely the easiest, um, they're easy to prepare because of their compact size. Um, the best method is roasting, which allows the sugars to caramelize. Um, as I mentioned, the honey nut being a hybrid of the butternut and buttercup. Um, it's also cured for up to three weeks in a temperature controlled environment um, after it's harvested, which helps the sugar condense, making it sweet, like I mentioned. Um, it contains beta carotene, vitamin A, uh, B complex vitamins like folate, um, niacin, uh, riboflavin, flavin, riboflavin. Um, it contains iron, uh, zinc, copper, calcium, potassium, and phosphorus. So it's got a lot of stuff in the tiny little package. So for this one, I made grain-free honey nut stuffing. So this is actually one of my family's favorite Thanksgiving recipes. Um, as mentioned, we have a lot of dietary restrictions, one of which is that most of us can't eat bread. So we had to give up bread stuffing a while ago. And so this is what I came up with um, as an alternative for our Thanksgiving dinner. Um, and you can use honey nut for this, or um, you can also use butternut if you can't get a honey nut for some reason. Um, but it's really good with the honey nut because the sweetness really comes out. Um, and it uh, also uses an onion, some celery. Uh, you can use ground pork or you can use like a ground pork sausage, um, an apple, some thyme, sage, rosemary. Um, if you use parsley for garnish, then you got parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. Uh, it uses some dried cranberries and an egg and some salt and pepper to taste. 
it's a wonderful combination. So to start with, you are going to peel the um, peel the squash and uh, cut it in half and scoop out the insides. And then you're going to cube it into about one inch um, large uh, one inch large um, cubes. And you're going to put a little olive oil on those, some salt and pepper, and then you are going to roast them at 375 degrees for about 35 minutes. And you can stir them halfway. I mean, halfway through it, you can stir them. <laughs> um, so then while those are cooking, you can saute your onions and um, uh, celery and garlic in a pan, um, salt and pepper to taste, when they're about halfway uh, cooked or, you know, when they're looking translucent, you can add in your meat and break it up with your spoon or your spatula into smaller pieces. When those are just about cooked, you can add in your apples. And then once it's fully cooked and your squash is out of the oven, you add in your squash. Um, did I say that you added the herbs in? You add the herbs in with the uh, apples. Um, then you last of all add in your cranberries. And if you have a larger oven than I have, you can cook it right in the cast iron skillet, or you can actually stuff it into a bird if you're cooking a bird at the time. Um, or you can transfer it to a casserole dish and put it in there. And last of all, you wanna take your beaten egg and you um, kind of distribute it along the top and then you can use a fork, just sort of move your stuffing around to get the egg to seep in a little bit, but you don't wanna like fully mix it in. And then you're gonna bake it again at 350 degrees for 35 minutes until the top is looking nice and golden brown and the egg is cooked. It is really delicious. The combination of the sweet squash and the apple and the sage and the cranberries um, along with the pork, it's just a wonderful marriage of flavors. It goes really well with all of your Thanksgiving dishes but it also is great just on its own as a dish. Um, and actually I've made a similar thing with using the squash with um, mushrooms instead of meat. And I left out the um, cranberries and the apples in that case. Um, and it was uh, also pretty tasty. So generally a, a yummy thing. Next up, we have the Hubbard squash. Um, the Hubbard is actually a name for a variety of different squashes that are all sort of similar. Um, the ones that we've had this year so far at the co-op are baby blues, which are a little on the smaller side. Um, but Hubbards have a rich, semi-sweet flavor, similar to cooked pumpkin, but perhaps a little bit sweeter. Um, the texture is tender and starchy. Again, pretty similar to a pumpkin. Um, the skin is hard and thick and tough. Uh, so not really something you want to eat. You could, but you probably don't want to. Um, the seeds are large and pretty similar to pumpkin seeds. Um, because of the tough skin, it's best to cook it with the skin on, so slicing it and roasting it and then scooping out the flesh. Uh, it's good for soups, casseroles, um, and sweet preparations. Uh, but as I say, the baby blues are on the smaller side, but Hubbards can have been known to reach up to 50 pounds. They can be real big boys. Um, so uh, a lot of the time when you see Hubbards, they're like quite massive. They're like over the size of jack lantern pumpkins. <laughs> um, and you can definitely eat those, uh, but they take a lot more processing. So it's nice if you can get a baby blue. Um, the Hubbards contain uh, vitamins A and C and some B and um, iron, uh, riboflavin, um, fiber and beta carotene. For this recipe, I did a Hubbard lasagna, um, which is actually what I had for lunch today. And it's got three different layers of fillings in it. I'm sorry, it's got two different layers of fillings in it. And then the noodles is the other layer. Um, the squash filling uses a Hubbard squash a puree, ricotta cheese, a little milk, um, some salt, and some nutmeg. The spinach filling is cooked spinach, um, ricotta cheese, mozzarella cheese, um, two cloves of minced garlic, and some salt. And then you'll also need some lasagna noodles, obviously, 
although actually you could totally make this with zoodles. Um, for those of you who don't know, zoodles are zucchini noodles, which you make by cutting zucchini really small. I mean thin, uh, at any rate. Um, lasagna noodles, I actually used some gluten-free um, uh, brown rice noodles, which worked really well. Um, mozzarella cheese, uh, some Parmesan cheese for the top, um, Italian seasoning, um, and some paprika and uh, some more basil. So to start out with, you're gonna to wanna to roast your Hubbard squash. Um, this is actually two pretty small baby blues um, that I had here. And let's see, you're gonna roast them at 425 degrees for 35 to 45 minutes. And then you're gonna to wanna to scoop out the insides. And then you're gonna mix the inside, uh, the, the Hubbard squash with um, some ricotta cheese, the nutmeg, some salt and the milk. And uh, that makes a nice um, squ squashy puree. Uh, and then you're gonna to wanna to do the same thing with the ingredients for the spinach mixture. And to, to start assembly, you will, you'll have cooked your noodles um, following the package instructions. Um, then you're gonna to wanna to take your casserole dish and put down a very thin layer of your squash first, then put noodles on top of that, then a little bit more squash, and then your, um, what do you call it? Your spinach uh, layer, then some mozzarella cheese, and then more noodles. And you're gonna repeat that about three times. And then uh, finish it off with the last layer of noodles, and then put down some mozzarella cheese, your Parmesan cheese, and um, some, um, your seasoning. Uh, then you are going to want to bake it again. Depends on the noodles. The noodles that I had, um, had you cook it for um, about 30 minutes covered with tin foil, and then you take the tin foil off and cook it for another 25 minutes to brown the top. Um, it'll be something relatively like that, depending on the noodles that you use. Um, this was a really yummy dish. Uh, the actually way back in the day when I was a little kid and eating at the co-op, um, they used to have a really nice lasagna that had a squash layer in it. And I thought it was so good when I was a kid. It was like my favorite thing that they had there. Um, so this was kind of similar to that. Um, the ricotta and the um, Hubbard mixed really well together. It went really nice with the spinach. This is a great option if you have a hard time with cooked tomato as some people do. And this makes a really nice dish. Uh, the cheesiness of it was perfectly proportionate. The noodles were really good. Um, all in all, super tasty. Next up, we have the spaghetti squash. Um, the spaghetti squash is also known as the vegetables, uh, as vegetable spaghetti, uh, noodle squash, mandarin squash, or vegetable marrow. Uh, it's a mild flavor, slightly sweet. Um, but it's best known for its texture. The flesh separates into long translucent like strings um, that resemble angel hair pasta. Um, and it's tender and slightly crunchy. Uh, it's got a thick smooth skin that you probably don't wanna try to eat. And um, the seeds are small and nutty. So spaghetti squash is um, best roasted or steamed um, or baked. Personally, I like roasting it because I feel like if you steam it, it gets a little too moist. And if you're pairing it with like a sauce, um, then it's um, better to have it a little on the drier side. Um, but as I say, it's best known for its stringy nature. Um, it's uh, flesh makes a really good substitute for pasta. Um, and, but it also works really well for casseroles and um, gratins. Grattans, am I saying that right? I never know if I'm saying that right. Um, but anyway, it was first discovered in China um, and it was used for a long time where they would dry it and eat it in the winter. Uh, but it was brought to Japan in the 1920s um, where it was developed into the variety that we know and love today. And it was introduced to the wild, wider world from there. Uh, but it wasn't immediately popular in the U.S. until grain shortages during the uh, World War II made pasta harder to get. Um, so it started being marketed as a pasta replacement. And today it's still popular 
as a low carb pasta substitute. And in fact, the dish that we will be making with it could be called a low carb uh, baked macaroni and cheese substitute. Twice baked cheesy spaghetti squash. So this uses one spaghetti squash, a cup of milk, um, one cup of cheddar cheese, one cup of mozzarella cheese, a tablespoon of flour, or you could use potato starch if you wanted to keep it grain free, um, about one and a half tablespoons of butter, some oregano, some basil, salt and pepper to taste, and then you can either use panko for the top, or you could use other breadcrumbs, or you could also use um, just another layer of cheese if you wanted to keep it grain free. So you're gonna start by cutting it in half lengthwise. And then you're gonna to wanna to scoop out the guts and the seeds. This is starting to sound familiar. Then you're going to turn it um, over onto its cut side and roast it for um, about uh, 35 to 45 minutes at 375 degrees. You don't want it to be like totally, totally cooked. Um, you want it to be a little al dente because you're going to twice bake it and you don't want it to get too bakey. Um, while your squash is cooking, you can melt your butter in a small pan and put in your flour and you're going to want to cook it over a low heat um, while you stir constantly until it starts to get brown. Then you're going to add in your milk whilst stirring and stir it so that it's fully incorporated. Once the um, milk starts to almost boil, uh, you'll add in your cheese and continue to cook while stirring, not letting it boil until it thickens up about twice as thick as when you started. And then you're gonna to wanna to take it off the heat. When your squash comes out of the oven, let it cool down a little bit until you can touch it without burning yourself. And then you're gonna to wanna to scrape it out with a fork, separating it into its noodly tendrils. And then you're gonna add in your um, sauce. And when you're scraping out the, um, the filling, make sure that you don't damage the, um, the skin itself, which is gonna act as your bowls for twice baking this. So mix together your squash and cheese sauce, and then you're going to want to put it back into a casserole dish and divide your filling in half and um, put it in, back into your shells. And then you can top it either with the panko or with um, different breadcrumbs or with more cheese. And you're gonna put it back in the oven for uh, about 20 minutes at 350 degrees to, um, until it's golden brown on the top. And I topped mine with a little um, parsley, which was quite nice. This was a really yummy dish. It was very similar to a baked macaroni and cheese that um, crunchy top was really nice. The noodles were pretty much um, uh, perfectly cooked and the cheese went really well with the mild sweetness of the squash. So I was mightily impressed. I know it looks like I ate that whole bowl in one sitting, but I actually only ate half of it. <laughs> Next up, we have the acorn squash. Um, it's a mildly sweet and nutty squash, has a tender and somewhat dry texture. Um, it's got a thin and edible skin and uh, the seeds are small and nutty. Um, it's great for roasting, um, stuffing, broiling, steaming, and grilling. Uh, it's commonly cut in half and um, filled with a stuffing um, in its bowl. Um, it's also good for stews and curries and risotto or pastas. Uh, it contains fiber, vitamin C, vitamin B6, uh, magnesium, uh, manganese, and potassium. So for this, we actually did a baked egg and acorn squash, which I think would be wonderful for a brunch. Um, you use one large acorn squash, uh, four eggs, salt and pepper to taste, and some olive oil. It's pretty, uh, pretty simple. I also put a little bit of spike, which is a seasoning mix, um, on top of mine. If you like um, different things on your eggs, you can certainly do that. You could probably put some hot sauce on there. You could also pair it with bacon quite nicely. I found a pretty nicely shaped acorn squash for this, uh, but you're going to cut it into rings. Um, about an inch thick, 
yeah, about an inch thick. Um, and then take a spoon and scrape out the guts and seeds from inside your rings. Um, place them on a baking sheet, a greased baking sheet, and uh, drizzle them with olive oil and salt and pepper to taste. And you're gonna bake those at 425 degrees for about, 20, uh, for about 15 minutes and then take them out. And while the pan and the squash is still hot, you will crack an egg into each of the rings. Um, you might lose some of the egg whites underneath the squash as it probably won't be a tight seal, um, but that's just gonna be the um, more watery part of the egg. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, the bulk of the egg will remain inside the uh, ring. So then you're gonna put them um, salt and pepper again, and then you're gonna put them back in the oven at 425 degrees for 10 to 15 minutes, depending on how much you like your egg yolk cooked. Uh, like I said, this was a great option for a brunch. It looks really pretty. It's very presentable. This egg paired really well with the um, mild flavor, mild nutty flavor of the squash. It was quite lovely. Plus look how cute, so cute. Next up, we have the Queen of Smyrna squash. And um, this is actually a main heritage squash. Um, it's got a nice, sweet, rich, nutty flavor, very similar to a kabocha, which is closely related to. It has a semi-dry, dense, smooth texture. It's got a um, thin, edible skin. Um, the seeds are highly fibrous, probably technically edible, but not at all pleasant to eat, so you can probably skip that part. Um, this uh, is good baked, roasted, um, boiled. It's a main variety, as mentioned, and it's only recently been cultivated, and it was from a chance mutation um, that was found in a squash field in Smyrna, and probably for about the last two decades, it's been being developed into the variety that we have today. Uh, but it is derived from the kabocha family. It's definitely um, similar. Uh, it's got this really nice white flesh, um, I mean, white skin, and then the flesh is actually a pretty, um, light color. So it's a really beautiful squash. And for this squash, we made a mushroom and a uh, Queen of Smyrna soup. So this uh, used one Queen of Smyrna, um, some shallots, uh, olive oil for sauteing, celery, carrots, garlic, um, fresh thyme, some veggie stock, oyster mushrooms, shiitake mushrooms, and um, milk or a dairy-free milk if you prefer, and some nutmeg and salt and pepper. So this was really nice. It's um, local main uh, mushrooms, uh, local variety of, um, of squash. So it was a really nice, um, very mainly soup. <laughs> So you're gonna start by cutting your kabocha, I mean, your, <laughs> your queen of Smyrna in half and um, scoop out the guts and seeds. And then you're gonna to wanna to, um, slice off the skin using a sharp knife and cut it into bite-sized cubes, whatever size cubes you like to eat. Then you're going to saute your um, shallots and your garlic in some olive oil. And when they start to turn translucent, you can add in your um, celery and carrots and your spices, I mean herbs, your herbs. And then once those have cooked for a few more minutes, you can add in your squash and your broth. And then you're gonna bring it to a, a boil, turn it to a simmer, put your mushrooms on top of the water, and then you can um, uh, put the lid on for a couple of minutes until the mushrooms have wilted and you can stir them into the soup without damaging them. And you're gonna let that cook until the squash is tender, which is probably about 10 to 15 minutes. And then once it's done, turn the heat off, mix your nutmeg in with your milk and then pour the milk into the soup and you will want to serve it hot. And it is so tasty. It's kind of like, um, it's similar to a chowder in that it's uh, milky, but it's lightly milky. 
the nutmeg goes really well with the squash. The wild mushrooms have a really lovely mushroomy flavor that goes so well with the whole thing. Um, just a really terrific soup. Uh, next up, we have the butternut squash, which is probably the most popular and versatile squash currently uh, on the American market. It's got a sweet nutty uh, flavor. It's tender and moist. Um, the skin is thin, but tough. Um, and the seeds are small and they're pretty much like the honey nut seeds. Uh, it's, as I said, very versatile. So you can roast it, toast it, um, steam it, saute it, bake it, braise it, grill it, um, pretty much anything you want. Uh, as I said, it's currently one of the most popular squash varieties there is. Um, it's partially because of the long neck and the small seed cavity um, means that you get the most bang for your buck with it because you're not um, spending money on, on the guts and the seeds, or not as much anyway. Um, it's, uh, it can be pureed or it can be cubed um, and put in soups, risottos and stuffings, ravioli, um, empanadas and curries or chilies, uh, all sorts of things. Um, it's good for savory or sweet applications. It's actually a recent, um, recently developed squash um, that was a mutation of the Canadian gooseneck squash. Um, butternut squashes were first cultivated in the 1930s. So for this one, we made a butternut wellington, which is a wonderful centerpiece for a holiday meal if you're looking for a nice vegetarian dish. Uh, if you're familiar with a beef wellington, a beef wellington is a um, beef roast that's been coated in a mushroom paste and then wrapped in pastry dough and baked. And this is a similar thing, but you use squash instead of beef. So for this, we used one butternut squash, uh, half a pound of cremini mushrooms, some garlic, some shallots, um, some fresh sage, soy sauce, uh, salt and pepper to taste, olive oil, one sheet of puff pastry, and some milk for um, brushing. So first of all, you're gonna cut your butternut squash. My butternut squash was kind of um, curved, which made it a little um, more difficult to work with. But uh, so I had to cut it a little funny, but pretty much you want um, a nice uh, long neck um, piece, a nice thick neck piece. Um, then you're gonna cut off the bulbous end, scoop out the seeds and guts, and then you're gonna roast all of the pieces together um, at 375 degrees for 35 to 45 minutes. You might have to take the bulbous end out um, earlier because it'll probably be done faster than the rest of it. Um, once it's out, you can cool it down, let it get to room temperature, and then you're gonna wanna use a really sharp knife to um, cut off the, uh, or trim off the skin of the neck um, here we'll, to not take away too much because that's your precious squash. Then you're gonna wanna saute the shallots and the um, garlic in some olive oil. Uh, when these are slightly translucent, you can add in your mushrooms. Once the mushrooms are about half cooked, you can add in your herbs, salt and pepper. Um, once your mushrooms are done, you can put them in a food processor and then you're gonna use the, the um, squash from the bulbous end of the um, squash. Uh, take it out of the skin and you're gonna add it in there and you're gonna blend it all up until you have a chunky paste. Then you're gonna to wanna to cut your pastry dough in half crosswise and um, make a nice bed of about a third of your mushroom mixture um, to lay your squash on. And you can put down your gooseneck. If you're using a slightly um, larger butternut than I was using, you should be able to um, get a nice second piece to fill out the size. I kind of cobbled one together from the other end of mine. Um, then you're gonna take the remainder of your mushroom mixture and um, you're gonna put it over the top. And then you're going to cover it over with uh, another, uh, the other piece of your pastry. Um, cut away the excess. You can save that and make some decorative stars if you'd like. And then you're going to um, crimp the ends with a fork 
cut some slips, slits over the top, put on your stars if you've made some, and then you're gonna brush it with a little bit of milk or some dairy pre or dairy alternative uh, milk. And then you're going to put it in the oven and bake it at 400 for 35 to 40 minutes. And um, you might need to cover it over with some tin foil um, in order to not get too brown. And then when it's done, you can let it cool down a little bit and then you're gonna cut it into some nice slices. And as you can see, it has a beautiful cross section. And um, I really liked this dish, it was really good. The mushrooms were the star of the show. They had such great flavor and then it went really well with the, um, with the more neutral squash. I really think that this would be a lovely option for any vegetarian holiday meal. And if you're vegan and can't do the puff pastry, actually, excuse me, I actually recommend um, cutting the squash in half and you can hollow out a cavity for it and fill it with the mushroom mixture. Put the other half back on it, wrap it up with string and bake it like that. And that also makes a really lovely um, centerpiece. Next up, we have the sweet dumpling squash. Um, also known as the dumpling squash or the dumpkin by me, occasionally, by accident. Um, it is a, a sweet and mild variety. The texture is um, smooth and light and tender. It's uh, got a thin skin that is edible and um, the seeds are small uh, with lower fiber. It's great for roasting, sauteing, baking, steaming, um, but it's ideal for stuffing because of its lovely tiny little serving size. Um, nature. Uh, it was originally developed in Yokohama, Japan in 1976 by Sitaka Seed Corporation. At the time, it was really popular in Japan to um, take uh, large American squash varieties and breed them into smaller kind of home chef varieties. So that's what happened here. Um, it was introduced to the American market as vegetable gourd, um, because uh, it apparently is similar looking to a decorative gourd, um, but not surprisingly, that didn't really um, make it super popular and it didn't gain commercial success until it was renamed the Sweet Dumpling because obviously Sweet Dumpling sounds super appealing. Um, it contains vitamins A, um, folate, uh, riboflavin, thiamine, beta-carotene, and fiber. Uh, the Sweet dumpling was used this time for sweet dumpling creme brulee, um, which is a absolutely adorable little dessert, self-contained, and would make a great addition to any holiday meal. It is uh, made with, um, this recipe used four sweet dumplings, um, five egg yolks, um, some vanilla extract, some allspice, cinnamon, nutmeg, uh, some sugar, obviously, and some um, heavy cream. Uh, so first you're gonna wanna cut the tops off the um, squash about an uh, inch down from the top, and you might need to even them out so that you have a nice um, level top for them. Scoop out the guts and seeds, and then you're actually going to bake just the tops of them cut side down uh, for at 350 degrees for about 25 minutes. And then you're gonna to wanna to scrape out the tops and um, set aside the flesh for your custard. Then you're going to take your egg yolks and mix them together with the sugar. Then you're going to take your heavy cream and your spices and bring them almost to a boil um, over medium heat. Um, once it almost boils, turn the heat off and then you're gonna add in the flesh that you got from the tops of your um, yummy little squashes. Then you're gonna mix them all together. And then um, finally, you're going to mix in the egg and sugar mixture, and then run it through a sieve to get out any chunks, and then pour it into your little squash vessels. Now this squash is a lot less dense than the carnival squash, so you don't need to pre-bake it, um, but you're gonna put your uh, leave, uh, by the way, leave a quarter of an inch-ish of room uh, between the custard and the top. And then you're going to put them into the oven again, and you're going to cook them at 325 degrees 
for 45 minutes to an hour until your custard is set. So when you shake the pan gently, you don't want your custard to be jiggly. Once they come out, you're gonna to wanna to, um, bring them to room temperature and then you can um, uh, chill them if you're not gonna eat them right away. Um, before serving, put about a teaspoon of sugar over the top of the custard and spread it out evenly. And you're gonna turn your broiler to high and place your custards underneath them. Um, and you're gonna to wanna to watch them really carefully because it can take anywhere from 15 seconds to a full minute for your um, sugar to uh, melt and caramelize. So you definitely wanna keep an eye on it. Um, just a uh, precursor, the sugar that I used is not real sugar because I do not eat real sugar. Um, this is monk fruit sweetener, so it didn't give it quite the same caramelized appearance as you would get. It was still yummy, but um, if you use real sugar, you will get a more creme brulee-ish looking top. But no matter, because it was still delicious. Um, so you're gonna wanna do that until your uh, sugar melts and it starts to um, brown and bubble. And then when you take it out, you will let it sit until that hardens, shouldn't take you long, and then serve um, directly after that. Uh, this was really nice. The texture of the custard was wonderful. It was super thick, eggy, sweet, vanilla-y. It had a nice spice to it. The mild um, addition of the squash that was in it was um, really subtle. And then the squash itself paired really well with it because, of course, it's a really rich, rich dessert. So having just the regular squash along the outside to scoop up with it was a really nice addition and it paired really well also with the crystallized top. So super yummy, um, absolutely delicious, highly recommend. And last but not least, we have the pie pumpkin. So the pie pumpkin is also known as a sugar pie pumpkin or a sugar pumpkin. Um, it's a type of heirloom pumpkin and it's got a mildly sweet, earthy and nutty flavor. Um, and it's got a tender and buttery texture. The skin is thin, the seeds are medium and have medium fiber and they're quite lovely for roasting. Um, this variety of pumpkin is best for roasting or broiling. Uh, it's most commonly used for baking applications such as pies, cheesecakes, tarts, spreads, custards, and flan. Um, but you can also use it in savory dishes like soups and curries and um, Nochi, nochi, I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, chili, empanadas, and curries. Um, as I said, it's an heirloom variety. Uh, it was grown by Native Americans first and then by early American colonists. Um, they used uh, the hollowed out interior of the pumpkin and filled it with spices and honey and milk and baked it in an oven or an open fire. Um, so that's sort of a familiar sounding dessert, honestly. Um, but what we did with it was the pum pie pumpkin crisp. So I didn't just want to make a pie um, with the pumpkin because um, most people know how to make pumpkin pie. Um, so instead, this dessert is a, a really nice fall um, dessert that's um, kind of a combination of the pumpkin pie and, and the uh, fruit crisp. Um, and it uses uh, one pie pumpkin, um, some uh, granulated sugar, uh, three eggs, two tisps of pumpkin pie spice, um, some salt, some vanilla extract, uh, two, quarters, two thirds of a cup of heavy cream. And then for the top, you're gonna use um, a cup of all purpose flour. I actually used um, whole wheat flour, worked nicely too. Um, three quarters of a cup of grated sugar, grated sugar, granulated sugar, uh, two teaspoons of cinnamon, some salt, and six tablespoons of unsalted butter. So to start with, you are going to cut your pumpkin in half, scoop out the seeds and guts, place it cut side down on a baking sheet, and you are going to bake it at 375 for 35 to 45 minutes until the pumpkin is tender. Then you're going to scrape out the inside and you are probably going to want to blend it to get a nice smooth puree. Then you're going to mix together your spices and the cream and the eggs, everything from that first part of the recipe. Um, and then you're going to pour it into a casserole dish. 
Then you're going to mix together your dry ingredients and then you're going to um, add in the melted butter and make a nice crumbly dough. Put that over the top of your uh, casserole dish. And then you're gonna bake it again at 375 for 30 to 40 minutes. And you're going to wanna serve it hot uh, or you know, nice and warm. And definitely you're gonna to wanna to do it with some vanilla ice cream. Um, the custard is really eggy. It's a little bit more eggy than a pumpkin pie custard. Um, and then that crunchy top is a really nice combination and it just goes so well together, hot with some ice cream. It's a really nice autumn dish. Um, and a nice variation of, um, of the pumpkin pie that we all know and love. And then just an honorable mention here, which is a squash that we just got in, but I didn't really have time to make anything with it yet. Um, but it is the black futsu squash, which is a Japanese heirloom variety. Uh, it's got a similar flavor to roasted chestnuts and a smooth creamy texture. It's got a thin an edible um, skin and it has um, small nutty seeds. It's good for both soups, uh, for both, sorry, it's good for both uh, raw and cooking applications. Um, baking, roasting, broiling, and stir frying all work really well, but also raw in salads, um, thinly sliced and layered with cheese and fruit um, is really good as well. Um, you can use it for savory or sweet dishes. Uh, it can also be pickled for extended use. Um, it, uh, it's um, classified as an ancient heirloom variety. Uh, the black futsu was cultivated in Japan since the 17th century, um, but it's thought to have been, uh, be an open pollinated cultivar that was brought to Japan by the Portuguese traders, um, but it's popular throughout Asia. It contains vitamin A and C, uh, calcium, fiber, beta carotene, and iron. Um, and it's also a really cute, interesting looking pumpkin. So a lot of the time it's also just used for decorative purposes because it's so nifty looking. Uh, so those are all of our squashes, but I wanted to leave you with some resources. I didn't have any specific um, cookbooks to recommend for this time, but I did wanna recommend this website um, which is specialtyproduce.com. And I use this for looking up pretty much any kind of produce that I haven't used before. Um, I use, I look it up on the site and they almost always have something about it. They describe the taste, the place, the place, the taste, the flavor, the texture. Um, it gives you uh, geography facts about it, um, information about growing them, um, the nutritional stuff. Um, it tells you pairings and different ways that you can cook it. Um, so it's definitely a really uh, cool website to check out. I use it a lot for the co-op to write descriptions for vegetables for the produce tags and stuff. But it's a great resource. Um, and then just leave you with some information about the upcoming classes. On Thursday, November 5th at 12, we have a mindful movement class that is taught by one of our co-op owners. Um, and then we have more cooking classes. We have uh, Curries of the World coming up next, which is Wednesday, November 18th at 4 p.m. I'm really excited about that one. I absolutely love curry and I have a huge list of different kinds of curries from all over the place to um, share with you. Then we have uh, traditional holiday foods of the world, which is gonna cover a lot of sweet and savory foods from all sorts of different um, winter festivals and holidays. And that's December, Wednesday, December 9th from, at 4 p.m. And then we have um, no sugar baking for the new year after everybody's decided on their new year's resolutions. And uh, that's Wednesday, January 6th at 4 p.m. I have been sugar free for five years. So I've um, gained a lot of inf uh, information over those years about how to uh, still enjoy desserts while not being able to eat sugar. So I'm looking forward to imparting some of that knowledge to you. So thank you so much for joining me this evening and I um, hope that you try out some of these recipes and uh, hope to see you again in an upcoming class. Thank you so much, everyone.